When I first moved to Waco, Texas, I felt a little bit like a fish out of water. I mean, so many different things, or so many things were different here. For starters, people don't just wear flip-flops all the time. That's a common thing in my hometown in South Florida. Second, there are all sorts of new words and new pronunciations or meanings of words that I thought I knew. Um, things like uh, Brazos um, or Bosky or uh, Health Camp. Because culture makes a difference. It shapes the things you do. It affects the way you feel. And in the French Revolution, it could determine who lived and who died. In this video, we're going to look at the culture of the terror. We're going to cover everything from uh, clothes to systems of measurement. And we'll consider how these things were central to the terror and how they shaped those who survived and those who did not. Okay, let's get going. this video, you're going to need something to take notes with, as always, and uh, four, yeah, four primary sources. The Constitution of 1793, uh, Entre Dumont's Law on the municipality, uh, or of the municipality of Saint-Quentin, and uh, two letters, letters of uh, Madame du Croquet and uh, Nicolas Rouault. To begin, let's remind ourselves what we mean by the terror, and then consider some of the ways that culture played a role in it. Before we begin, let's remind ourselves what the terror was precisely. In the last video, uh, we looked at four things that characterized the Great Terror of 1793 to 1794. The first was the institutionalization of popular violence. The revolutionary state co-opted the violence that was, from the beginning, the purview of the Parisian crowd. Montagnards used violence to persecute their political enemies, target those that the Parisian crowd long hated, and avenge betrayals such as the Federalist and Vendean revolts. A second characteristic of the terror was the total political control of the Montagnards. We covered this two videos ago. The terror was a period of political uniformity, an era when the revolutionary government was essentially a one-party state. The third characteristic was the suspension of democratic governance. We saw this process occur in the last video. Over the course of a few months, all political power in France ended up in the hands of the Twelve Who Ruled the members of the Committee of Public Safety. And at the committee's head was none other than Maximilien Robespierre. The fourth and final characteristic is the one that we're going to deal with in this video, the enforcement of Jacobin political culture. But what do we mean by Jacobin political culture? Well, uh, we'll look at that together in a bit. But to begin, let's define Jacobin political culture as uh, political and cultural sensibilities that were unabashedly anti-aristocratic and pro sans culotte. The sans culotte, you may remember, were the Parisian workers who were active in the Cordelier Club, the Jacobin Clubs, and uh, popular protests that rocked the legislative assemblies and, and national convention. Jacobin political culture is what we might call uh, lowbrow culture, sort of the celebration of equality, the people, and the nation above the privileged, exceptional, and wealthy. So why was this culture so important during the terror? Well, to answer that question, we should revisit one of the laws that you read for the last video, the Law of Suspects. If you remember, the Law of Suspects called for the immediate arrest of all those who were deemed suspects by the state. The law also helped uh, define who a suspect was with these words. The following are deemed suspects. Those who, by their conduct, associations, comments, or writings have shown themselves partisans of tyranny or federalism and enemies of liberty. It also said those former nobles, together with husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, sons or daughters, brothers or sisters, and agents of emigres who have not constantly demonstrated their devotion to the revolution. The text of the law, of course, begs the question, uh, how does one show themselves to be a partisan of tyranny or an enemy of liberty? I mean, how does one constantly demonstrate their devotion to the revolution? These are all abstract concepts. What did this all mean? 
Well, the answer, more often than not, had to do with culture. Certain cultural behaviors, language, objects, etc., became associated with the revolution and with patriotism. Certain cultural sensibilities became identified with the counter-revolution and a rejection of the nation. Participating in one or the other could determine whether or not you were deemed a suspect. And being deemed a suspect could well result in your trial and possible execution. So how did Jacobin culture make its way into the political culture of the terror? Well, we can see changes in a few ways. First, we can look at how people talked. Aristocratic titles and privileges of all sorts were out of fashion in Jacobin political culture, so formal greetings like Madame and Monsieur were abandoned. People whose names included aristocratic elements, uh, think of the Duc d'Orléans, for example, often abandoned them to adopt something that reflected one's promotion of liberty or equality. Again, see if Philippe Egalité. More generally, however, people began to use the terms citizen and citizeness to refer to each other rather than Mr. and Mrs. or, or Madame and Monsieur of the old regime. Check out this sign from the revolution. This is a sign that hung above the door of a tabac, or what we might think of as a, a, like a sort of corner store. On the sign, the store's patron uh, made a few things clear. First, it was prohibited from entering um, uh, the store. Uh, uh, people were prohibited from entering the store unless they were wearing a revolutionary cockade, the brooch of blue, white, and red that was popular among revolutionaries from the early stages of the revolution. Next, the store owner also mandated that everyone use the title of citizen when addressing each other. The point was to emphasize equality. Everyone was a citizen on equal footing with everyone else, and none uh, was above anyone else. Similarly, Jacobin political culture preferred the vulgar to the formal. One of the most obvious ways that we see this is in the elimination of a particular grammatical structure in French, the use of vous. Vous is the formal you. It's used when you're trying to be polite or when you're being deferential because you don't know a person. Tu, by contrast, is the familiar you. It's used when you're friends with a person or related to them. During the terror, vous became anathema. No one was to refer to anyone else with deference. All were equal and members of the same national family, so everyone was a tu, whether they be rich or poor, from privileged means or common, a stranger or a neighbor. Philippe Egalité wasn't the only person to get a new name during the revolution either. Another element of Jacobin political culture was the intense campaign of renaming public spaces. Anything that reeked of privilege, aristocracy, the church, etc., it was replaced with names that harkened back to nature or to abstract revolutionary concepts like liberty and fraternity. Streets formerly named after saints became Equality Street, Liberty Ave. In one of the most famous examples, the Place Louis XV, uh, which held a, a statue of the oft-reviled king on horseback, was renamed the Place de la Révolution. And the statue of Louis was replaced with a statue of liberty. The point was to replace all vestiges of the privileged past with signs of the times, acknowledgments of the values of the new regime. Yet language wasn't the only way that we see Jacobin political culture take center stage. Fashion also revealed this shift. Once again, people began to move away from fashion reminiscent of the aristocracy, wealth, and privilege. They adopted clothing that was simple, symbolic of the revolution, and more aligned with the sensibilities of the sans-culottes, who themselves were defined originally by what they wore. For women, the change looked something like this. Here's a somewhat satirical image of an aristocratic couple from the old regime. The woman's dress is full of ornamental elements. Her hair is styled up in an elaborate bun with jewels. The arms of her dress have lace and frills. And to the right is a mock-up of a woman from uh, 1790 dressing a la Constitution, as it was called. The dress is simple. The colors of blue, white, and red reflect the woman's adherence to the revolution. Her hair is down over her shoulders in what many of the day would call a more natural style. And her hat, of course, is sporting a blue, white, and red ribbon. For men, the change was even more dramatic. Check out the foppish aristocrat on the left. He's wearing culottes, of course, you know, the sort of capri pants with silk stockings. His hair is in curls with a bow, or perhaps it's an ornate wig. That's probably the more likely scenario. His coat is bejeweled and lovely. Lace is on his cuffs. Everything's so pretty. Uh, but on the right is the image of the sans culotte. He's wearing pants. Pants! A simple shirt. Wooden clogs. 
and a brown, plain coat. His hat has the revolutionary cockade. The only thing that's missing is the Phrygian cap. That's the red hat that was popular among workers and revolutionary radicals. And of course, he's smoking a pipe, because, you know, why not? This is sans culotte fashion, and it became more and more widely appropriated in the period of the Great Terror. This became sort of the outfit of the true revolutionary. What you wore and how you spoke, these were things that were indications of one's revolutionary sentiments or sensibilities, and one's acceptance of the kind of culture of the new regime. But the regime of the terror became far more intentional about changing French culture in a few other ways. Perhaps the best example is the campaign of de-Christianization that representatives of the National Convention implemented throughout France in 1793. Dechristianization was essentially a program whereby representatives from the convention, uh, usually decided Montagnards, systematically erased the elements of Christianity present in the public sphere. Revolutionaries shut down churches, destroyed religious objects, removed crucifixes from public areas, and even disbanded monastic communities. The initiative began with Joseph Fouché, the representative on mission in the Nièvre in central France. Fouché came to the region in September 1793, after he had already um, spent time in Lyon, as we remember, and he decided early on that priests had been largely responsible for the counter-revolutionary fervor happening in the nearby Vendée. Fouché responded by attacking the church. He shut down parishes, forced clerics to marry on the spot. Fouché also began tearing apart religious buildings and symbols in the region. He ordered that graveyards no longer have religious uh, symbols like, like crucifixes or crosses. In brief, he sought to wipe the church from the face of public life. Fouché's campaign of dechristianization eventually spread. Representative Dumont, serving in Abbeville, forced priests to denounce their clerical orders. Representative Roule in Reims personally supervised the smashing of a file of sacred oil supposedly to have been used in the coronation of Clovis himself, and since used to anoint every single French king. Crowds soon joined in, looting churches, carrying off silver, candlesticks, statues, etc. They broke stained glass windows, stole clerical vestments, decapitated statues of saints and holy figures. They melted down church bells, made them into cannons, rifles, and shot for the Republican armies. Soon, iconoclasm and pillage of churches became a central component to the terror. Dechristianization reached Paris, too. The Paris Commune made dechristianization an official policy in October 1793. They ordered the images of kings in the front of the Cathedral of Notre Dame to be removed. The word saint was to be taken off street signs. Busts of Marat were placed in spots that used to have religious statues. Paris sections declared all churches in the ne their neighborhoods closed and all priests expelled. And then on November 10, 1793, municipal authorities hosted a festival of reason in the Cathedral of Notre Dame. They paraded young French women dressed as patriotic maidens to an altar erected to philosophy and employed an actress to play the role of liberty wearing a bright red Phrygian cap. She then embraced members of the convention and those in attendance. Dechristianization thus became not only the destruction of church goods and services, but also the replacement of the entire business of the Catholic Church. Revolutionaries during the terror sought not only to rid France of Catholicism, but also to replace Catholicism with a civic religion based on the principles of the revolution itself. To see dechristianization a little more closely, it's now time to stop the video and read the primary sources that I mentioned earlier. In particular, there's one that really speaks to what dechristianization was about and why representatives from the National Convention were so intent to put it into place. Here's one example of a regulation aimed at dechristianization. We see many of the same actions that happen in other parts of the country, but we also see this curious ex explanation given for these acts. Considering that the time has come when fanaticism and religious superstition must disappear forever from the soil of liberty, that it is urgent that the throne of error and falsehood be overthrown at the same time as that of the tyrant, to be replaced by the eternal reign of reason and philosophy, 
that all individuals uh, hitherto known under the general name of priests or ministers of public worship, disavowing the errors and prejudices, prejudices to which they have been subjugated until now, must finally take in the social order the place which nature has assigned them, and that all churches and chapels for too long the theater of imposture become today temples of reason, schools of republican virtue. Revolutionary government now adopted an ideology that saw the practice of Christianity itself as superstitious and fanatical. They sought to replace the fanaticism of Christianity with a cult of reason that better supported the mission of the revolutionaries to transform French politics and culture. Finally, the regime of the terror also implemented new laws at the national level that transformed French culture in the way that French citizens lived their lives in many different ways. So what other things did the National Convention enact that illustrated Jacobin political culture and transformed the culture of revolutionary France? The earliest piece of legislation along these lines was actually the Montagnard Constitution, completed in June 1793 and passed a few months later after a nationwide referendum. Like the Constitution that preceded it, the Constitution of 1793 set out the individual rights of French citizens and set the structure for the political regime. Now, we know that the Constitution only lasted a few months before it was suspended on account of the decree of revolutionary government, but uh, the document still gives us clues into what Montagnards valued. More than any other constitution of the revolutionary era, the, Mon- era, uh, the Montagnard Constitution was the most egalitarian. It extended rights to all men over the age of 21 without property or wealth, wealth restrictions. It declared that popular sovereignty included all French citizens made deputies of the assembly responsible to the whole of the nation rather than simply their own constituency. It pushed for an unparalleled uniformity across the whole nation and provided measures of social relief for the poorest in society. It was, in other words, a constitution for the sans-culottes, and those who had long espoused their cause. In August, the convention adopted another law that transformed daily life in France. The convention mandated the adoption of a new system of weights and measurements, the metric system. The system was to replace the old traditional system in France, a system that was not all that dissimilar to our current system of feet, yards, pounds, and other measurements. The metric system replaced these units, units which historically were tied to the monarchy. I mean, after all, it was the king's foot that designated how long a foot was centuries ago. Uh, This metric system uh, replaced it with a system of measurement based on nature, The meter, for example, is one ten millionth the distance from the equator to the North Pole. Did you know that? Fun fact. Once again, Jacobin ideals became clear in this action. The idea was to replace a privileged system of measurements with one that was defined by nature, and thus egalitarian. Throughout Paris and other cities in France, new measurements were literally carved into the sides of buildings so that vendors could use them in their daily transactions. To deal with the war, the Committee of Public Safety in the National Convention also passed a law in August 1793 that called for the conscription of all of society. In the law, called the Levé en Masse, uh, all Frenchmen are in, uh, as the law said, are in permanent requisition for the service of the armies. The young men shall go to battle, the married men shall forge arms and transport provisions, the women shall make tents and clothing and shall serve in the hospitals, the children shall turn old linen into lint, the aged shall take themselves to the public places in order to arouse the courage of the warriors and preach the hatred of kings and the unity of the republic. Again, the law was both practical and, of course, symbolic. The new government needed more people mobilized for the war effort, but it also wanted to make a statement about the unity of the nation. All should be involved in protecting the patrie, no matter who they were and what their abilities. In October, the revolutionaries of the terror also chose to redefine time, The work of Fabre d'Eglantin, a poet and playwright and close associate of Georges Danton, the revolutionary calendar set out a new system of months, weeks, and days. The regeneration of the French people and the establishment of the Republic has necessarily led to the reform of the vernacular era, wrote Eglantin. We can no longer count the years during which kings oppressed us as an era during which we had lived. The prejudices and lies of both the throne and the church sullied each page of the calendar we were using. Eglantine's calendar had 12 months of 30 days each. Each week was 10 days, thus eliminating Sundays, of course. The months were named, somewhat creatively, after natural phenomena. 
All Saints' Day's religious holidays were removed. Revolutionaries now dated their letters using this new calendar, which started time with the promulgation of the first French, French Constitution in 1791. Revolutionaries of the Terror were living in the year two. Everything before was to be forgotten into a prehistory devoid of meaning or category. In December, the Committee of Public Safety approved a law from a representative, Bouquier, enacting something entirely new, mandatory public education. The law dictated that public schooling would be given to all children in France. Indeed, parents were compelled to send their children to public schools on pain of a fine and eventually, or eventually, the loss of their citizenship rights. The idea was to use public schools as institutions for a Republican education. Young people would come to adopt the ideals of the revolution, learn to love the nation, and eliminate old notions of privilege from their minds. Public schools were to be the starting point for the transformation of all of society. And then finally, in February 1794, in the middle of the Great Terror, the National Convention deliberated and eventually approved the abolition of slavery in all French territories. Abolition had been an issue that revolutionaries had debated since the very beginning of the revolution, if you can remember. Cahiers from all over France called for it. But if you can remember also, the institution of slavery was preserved in the First National Assembly and Legislative Assembly in large part because of the influence of colonial planters and investors in colonial trade. But the success of Haitian revolutionaries in 1791 uh, and beyond changed the equation. And now, Montagnard-led convention saw the situation in the former colony impossible to control without giving in to the demands of the Haitian revolutionaries. Fearing a British or Spanish invasion of Haiti, and thus the permanent loss of colonial revenue, the Montagnards at last affirmed the abolition of slavery in hopes of winning back support from those formerly enslaved Haitians who had freed themselves. So, what were the results of all of this? I mean, why do all these measures matter? Well, in defining culture in very specific ways and in putting those cultural sensibilities into law, the Montagnards of the Terror were drawing lines for what made a good supporter of the revolution and what made a bad one. Culture did the work of interpretation, showing who was trustworthy and who was not. But it also provided a means by which the regime of the Terror could effectively carry out its policy of state-sanctioned violence. One's adoption, or lack thereof, of the cultural symbols and practices highlighted in this video could determine one's ability to withstand accusations and possibly conviction in the Revolutionary Tribunal. To highlight this, I'm going to read a few lines from the register of a Revolutionary Tribunal uh, as it was included in Christopher Hibbert's The Days of the French Revolution. He, these are real accounts of French people tried in the tribunal during the terror and the reasons that they were tried and eventually convicted. Jean-Baptiste Henri, aged 18, a journeyman tailor, convicted of having sawed down a tree of liberty, executed 6 September 1793. Jean Julien, a wagoneer, having been sentenced to 12 years hard labor, took it into his head to cry, eh, Vive le roi! Brought back to the tribunal and condemned to death. Stephen Thomas Oji Bolning, aged 46, convicted of having entrusted his son aged 14, to a garde du corps in order that he might emigrate, condemned to death and executed the same day. Henriette Françoise de Marbeuf, aged 55, widow of the ci defant or former, former Marquis de Marbeuf, convicted of having hoped for the arrival of the Austrians and Prussians, of keeping provisions for them, condemned to death and executed the same day. And Francois Bertrand, aged 37, a publican, the Department of the Côte d'Or, convicted of having furnished to the defenders of the country sour wine, injurious to their health, condemned to death at Paris and executed the same day. Look at all these examples. Look at the things that they were convicted of, the ways that they were deemed to be enemies of the state. With one exception, these were no aristocrats, they were not refractory clergy or federalists who had conspicuously adopted the mantle of counter-revolution. These were ordinary French citizens. But in these various ways, their inability to conform to the cultural sensibilities of the Jacobins led to their condemnation. And this was why culture was so important. It protected people. 
or it provided the means for their conviction and their death. So what was the National Convention and the Committee for Public Safety doing with all of these laws and initiatives? I mean, why go to all this trouble? The answer is in some ways very simple. Culture became a way to answer the fundamental question of the terror. Who's for us and who's against us? Using Jacobin language or um, wearing sans culotte clothing or avoiding churches or even measuring things in grams, if you can believe it, all of this showed that you were a patriot. You could be trusted. In this way, political culture was a matter of life and death. It was literally the reason that some people survived the terror and some people did not. But on a higher level, we can also think of these cultural initiatives as representative of what the Montagnards wanted. They didn't want to simply change the political state. They wanted to change the nation. They wanted to change French people. They wanted to change them into people who were different, people who valued uh, natural laws, people who valued liberty and equality, all these things that the revolution had talked about, the elimination of privilege. The Montagnards were ideologues. They were led to try to pursue some sort of ideological end goal. And changing culture, changing um, the way people talked, this was all sort of part of this larger process. Okay, that's it for today. Good job. See you in class. Keep it up.